Hello everyone, this is a special edition episode of OCD Clinical Industry Voice. Just like the rest of the world, we temporarily moved our production to a home-based mode. So today, our first special guest is Maya Zlatanova, the CEO at Find Me Cure. Maya, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Anna. With the recent developments in the world, the clinical trial landscape has been changing as well with FDA working hard to design the best solutions to keep the research afloat. So today we will be talking about virtual clinical trials. Maya, my question, my first question is this. In its recent guide, the FDA is addressing industry, the investigators, the institutional review board on the, um, let me quote it, conduct of clinical trials of medical products during COVID-19 pandemic, urging them to move toward virtual clinical trials. Do you think it's possible? That's a very good question. And I, it's a question that is hard to be answered. Uh, my overall opinion is yes, this is possible because virtual clinical trials is nothing new to the industry. Uh, yes, it's new to some companies, but it's also a uh, reality that a lot of companies started doing virtual or actually, to be honest, not that much virtual, like full virtual clinical trials, more like hybrid clinical trials. And um, there are companies out there with the experience doing that. And also the FDA, when they, um, they issue this guidance, these guidelines for like recommending moving the, the patient's visits away from the site and more uh, in their homes, it was to introduce these virtual elements of the clinical trial. So a lot of the clinical trials, they won't become fully virtual, but they will have these virtual elements in order to keep going and supporting the patients. Um, and again, it's important to also say that, uh, yes, virtual is possible, but uh, it's also true that the majority of companies lack the experience of doing this previously, right? So the question here is, who is going to support these companies? Uh, I hope that there are plenty of providers with the experience, with the technologies out there to support these companies. Uh, my only fear is that uh, because of the lack of experience, previous experience, and because of the rush uh, now to support uh, ongoing clinical trials, there will be companies that wouldn't know exactly what to do and uh, because of the, the rush once again, because of lack of time, they might do some mistakes which might be like translated later that virtual trials are not working, which I hope won't happen. Mm -hmm. And in your opinion, which processes, processes are the least complicated to make virtual and which would be uh, the most challenging? Um, there is one general rule in the clinical trial scene that uh, is always valid and is valid here as well. Um, it depends on the protocol. Uh, there are already clinical trials that are accommodating uh, virtual uh, type of visits at home and uh, um, uh, they will, what they will do uh, uh, just is literally increasing the number of virtual visits uh, versus the ones that the patient will do at the site. Uh, the easiest ones will be visits that don't require any, um, any intervention, like for example, surgical intervention is impossible, right? Um, or any um, like, like very um, complicated intervention. Um, it's, it's great to see that some interventions that we thought that won't, cannot be done virtually are now possible to be done virtually. And I'll give you one example with infusions. It used to be the case that the patients that are part of clinical trials uh, that have infusions in their, uh, as, as their treatment, they will have to go to the hospital in order to have this intervention there, right? But now there are service providers providing this at home, which is great. And I think that with the time, we'll see more and more uh, possibilities making the virtual visits uh, easier and easier. If we talk about... Um enrollment and site selection mm -hmm. in particular. What do you think will change in this area? I think that patient recruitment cannot be solved without virtual clinical trials and without uh, the centralized clinical trials. Um, here is maybe the time to also mention that in my opinion, virtual and the centralized clinical trials are different. They might share same elements and in general virtual clinical trials um, 
there, there is a variety of different types of virtual clinical trials, like I said, from hybrid to fully virtual uh, clinical trials. And then the centralized, is, it's a different model that still has some elements of virtual. Um, and I'll start with uh, virtual, why this would help patient recruitment and is one of the ways to solve challenges that we have with patient recruitment. Uh, the majority of protocols are getting uh, complicated and complicated, like more complicated. It, they require a lot more um, data to, give, to be gathered. And with the help of uh, medical devices, moni monitoring um, solutions and diagnostics, uh, with the help of technology, uh, all these uh, protocols uh, can now become a little bit more virtual or hybrid. Um, and that would mean that the burden on the patients will be lower. Um, previously, patients that couldn't be a part of a clinical trial because the clinical trial was not aligned with their schedule, like their, their daily schedule, now will be more flexible on doing that. We also have, there are already companies out there that gave us example how they can completely do everything from, like, from patient recruitment to the final like close of the study, fully virtual by recruiting the patients uh, like digitally and then uh, going through the entire clinical trial, um, clinical study, of only through questionnaires and, 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 and virtual uh, elements. But then it really depends on the protocol and on the condition. When it comes to the centralized, uh, this is another story. It's even, I'm here, this is where I'm even more enthusiastic about, basically, mm -hmm. because um, the biggest, we do have challenges with patient recruitment, but let's face the reality is that um, the challenges became bigger, not because the landscape changed. Uh, yes, it's a little bit because the protocols, like I said, they, 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 they got more complicated, but more complicated means also uh, indications are different and eligibility criteria are different. So let's speak now about oncology clinical trials that are really like a majority of clinical trials are in oncology, right? So uh, because of the eligibility criteria and because uh, we are moving towards um, personalized medicine, um, even though you might have a protocol for breast cancer, for example, the eligibility criteria will make these breast cancer patients, again, rare to find, like rare to, like with mutations, with uh, a lot of other, th like previous treatments, etc. cetera. And, um, and what this has in common with rare diseases is that it's not that you can open one site uh, where you can find hundreds of patients like that. In most cases, you open one site and there will be one, two, three uh, patients the most, right? And let's not forget that competition is there as well. So uh, multiple clinical trials will compete for the very few patients that are in the site. So what companies are doing now is trying to open more and more sites in order to make sure that they will meet their patient recruitment target on time. But opening more sites also means increasing of budget, right? So mm -hmm. this is not sustainable. Most of the pharmaceutical companies are already working uh, towards decreasing the budget that they spend on R&D. And... Um, if they still want to keep their, like, uh, to have their clinical trials on track and in a timely manner to, to prove a drug and, and put it on the market, but then keep these costs down, they need to find a new formula. This formula is exactly the centralized clinical trials because how they work, uh, it's, you have this central, central site with the main team uh, of principal investigators and investigators that are taking care um, of like the, the main data management and uh, uh, like monitoring of the patients, like uh, the safety, the entire responsibility on their shoulders. And then they are to work with the so-called satellite sites. And a satellite site might be a small practice somewhere in a village uh, or uh, like a small town, for example, that you would anyway not consider as a site, right? They might not have even like down the road, of course, that's not like happening now, but down the road, the satellite sites might not have even the experience running clinical trials, but when they're under control of the, the central site, they will be still able to perform the clinical trial. And so the patients that they have will be able to be a part of the, the study as well. So um, this will, will make it easier to keep the cost low, to have like uh, 
let's say one central side and 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 uh, like one team of really professional uh, um, let's say experienced people running clinical trials and then multiple doctors becoming investigators to to help with um uh with uh, recruitment by working directly with their patients not not needing any referral channels or anything like that and this is maybe also where we need to mention that in order for this to happen in its full, it, its full capacity, we, we will also need to progress with electronic medical records because in, like, in the ideal world, I like, I like to imagine the ideal world, in an ideal world, every patient will have a medical record, electronic medical record, and then an algorithm will, will select the patients that are the best match for a certain clinical trial protocol, and doctors will be notified no matter where they are, no matter what's their background in research or not, will be notified on um, uh, the fact that one of their patients might be eligible for a clinical trial, and then we'll have the tools and technology to allow them to be, uh, to, how to say, to empower the patient to be a part of this clinical trial. And then a central place will monitor the entire thing. Yeah, and I apologize for interrupting, but since you already touched upon um, virtual visits, could you please elaborate on how exactly the virtual visits work and decentralized mm -hmm. trial work and how exactly they can help in situations like pandemic? Yeah, I will give you one example, really fresh example from a couple of days ago. Um, one of the jobs of FIMICURE, uh, it's an, a part of our mission is to support uh, patients uh, while they're volunteering for clinical trials. And so one of the patients uh, reached out to us. Uh, she has a very um, severe uh, uh, cancer, a very progressed one. Um, and so she managed to join a clinical trial that was outside of her country. It was, uh, it was in Switzerland. Uh, and that was her her only chance, so to say, at least for the time being, that was her only chance of uh, getting a treatment. Um, and because the pandemic started, she was advised that she goes back. Uh, uh, she's from a country outside of uh, outside of Europe, and so she had to go back. But going back uh, didn't allow her to continue with being a part of this clinical trial. So for her, that means that she's losing her hope her chance of having the treatment. If the clinical trial, and now I'm giving you the, an example how virtual, the virtual elements can now fit in. If the clinical trial was to, uh, to be adapted to the current situation, uh, then they would move all her visits and all her interventions uh, remotely. For example, uh, the way she feels and uh, what her, what her uh, let's say, um, how she feels and side effects, etc., can be entirely moved to a, a digital platform that she has on her mobile device, mm -hmm. um, uh, like also implemented by being implemented with uh, uh, ePro, so that she can uh, provide real-time um, insights on how she feels. And then the intervention, uh, in her case, that was infusion. Uh, there, there, there are local um, home healthcare providers that are also providing infusion services that can be a, a part of this platform, digital platform, where they have a scheduled visits to, to meet her at her home and provide the intervention at her, at her home. And then uh, all the, the diagrams and uh, not, I'm sorry, not the diagrams, but um, all the, the let's say heart rate monitoring and all other stuff can be also done through medical devices that can be connected to uh, her mobile application and the entire virtual platform and will fill, feed in a lot of data real time. So that's an example how we should be working in such, in such cases. Thank you very much for such a great example. Uh, moving on to uh, the next question. Uh, in your opinion, are home visits and sightless uh, monitoring an option in Europe in general? Uh, Europe is uh, also very well positioned uh, doing these uh, like sightless uh, and remote monitoring um, uh, solutions. They are providers as well, but as always, we're kind of behind because um, usually, and you can see that even now happening, Emma is following what the FDA is, is like telling to the rest of the world, and that's usually what's happening. Uh, the United States is the biggest market for, 
for uh, pharmaceuticals and drugs. And so they are better equipped doing that. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we don't have the solutions and the technology. Uh, and also, let's also uh, take into consideration the fact that technology is not limited by location or geographical location. It's limited only maybe by uh, some compliance uh, issues and then, uh, let's say, languages. Uh, on top of that, yes, we have to also take into consideration the fact that in, in Europe, we have different countries with different cultures. And yet, patients are patients, right? So I think that we do have some in-house providers, but we can also take advantage from US providers of these technologies and services. Uh, we, we recently uh, published an article on home healthcare service providers for the USA and for Europe. And I was very like, surprised and amazed to see that we have a lot of providers, like I speak about leaders on the market. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more um, us being a little bit more conservative and not so proactive looking at the alternatives and being flexible. And I can also add to that, that uh, not only the vendors themselves, but also the governments of many countries, they have initiated a lot of support programs for uh, clinical research. So what steps are being taken in Europe and in Bulgaria in particular? Um, Europe, again, is following what the FDA is saying. Uh, most of the, and actually, I'm so happy to see that FDA and EMA work very close uh, to each other. Uh, they, they have these programs where they exchange um, teams of experts. Uh, for example, FDA team, team goes and spends some time in EMA and the other way around, which is really great because they can share experience and the know-how. Um, so I don't see anything different happening in, in EMA uh, and in Europe in general. Um, the only thing is that we, we accept things with a little bit delay, so to say. But all the country leg legislations are following what Emma is saying. And I'm pretty uh, sure soon um, these country specifics will even disappear. And we will all follow what Emma will have to say on the topic. Um, something else maybe... Um, in general, um, what I see in, in like FDA doing is being a lot more proactive on reaching out the clinical research uh, uh, vendors and uh, uh, company sponsors, uh, clinical research organizations, uh, proactively spreading the word what are the different resources that they can provide with, uh, also on timelines, which is something that I don't see that much coming from Emma. But uh, in, if we have to summarize what they're all doing at the moment is trying to shorten the timelines uh, needed for running research, mainly on COVID-19. And then for the rest of the clinical trials is providing some guidance, uh, what can be done in these circumstances so that you don't need to cancel your clinical trials. And I just had a conversation a day ago with uh, um, an ex-director from EMMA who gave me some really positive news that he, like so far, He's now consulting different companies and he's being pro really active in this space. So he said that um, he hasn't heard of any clinical trials being canceled, postponed, yes. And we, when we speak about postponed, we speak about patient recruitment, uh, I'm sorry, clinical trials in active patient recruitment. Uh, so they are just being postponed for a little bit later. But then the ones that are ongoing, they, they finish their patient recruitment. These are the ones that are now trying to adopt new ways to support these patients and to also gather the data that they need. But so far, as I said, no, no stopped clinical trials, just delayed or kind of like uh, running in a different mode. <laughs> So that would be all for today. Maya, thank you very much for joining us today and giving your thoughts and expertise. We appreciate it. It was a pleasure for me, Anna. Your questions were really to the point at this uh, time being in these circumstances. And one last thing that I want to say to everyone that's watching, what we need at the moment is really being proactive and uh, uh, brainstorming how we can improve clinical research, but just not temporarily, but long-term. Thank you once again, Anna. Thank you.